Hello, hello. Hey. Okay, let's start. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today at this webinar about creating content marketing strategies in the B2B sector. My name is Gina Gulberti, and here next to me, here on the other side, I have uh, <laughs> Lee Auden. <laughs> I will tell you a little bit about him uh, in a while. So before we start the webinar, I would like to remind everyone some housekeeping stuff for, for, for this session. The first thing is we are going to do the webinar and we'll have like at the end of the webinar, like more or less 10 to 15 minutes to uh, answer some of your questions. We already received some of them on social media, but in case you have any other questions during uh, the presentation, you have here below. Uh, the questions option in which you can write your questions, your doubts, your uh, thoughts, etc., and we'll try to answer them um, at the end of the of the webinar. Then, uh, second thing, uh, obviously we are going to record this session, and tomorrow we will prepare a summary, like a blog post, uh, with the summary of all the topics that we have been uh, we are going to be uh, covering in this uh, in this live event. So stay tuned, we'll send an email to all the registrants to, uh, of the webinar. So in case uh, you want to share with someone or uh, in case you cannot uh, stay for the whole session, don't worry because we will send you all the material tomorrow so you can uh, take your time to uh, watch it and, and read the article. And then, uh, well, finally, I have to say, um, we are living, I guess, globally a quite complicated moment uh, right now in Europe, in US, everywhere. Um, so obviously we hope that everyone is safe at their houses and let's try to have some fun uh, this afternoon uh, or morning for the US. Let's try to, to talk about content marketing and strategies in the B2B. It's where, what we will try to do with Lee today. So, so I hope everyone is, is okay. So, Say that, let's start with the session. Well, uh, first of all, I would like to introduce you to b2bmarketers.com. So um, this is an, a new project we have launched just two months ago. And uh, we are super excited with because uh, there's many people that was registered into to this session. And obviously, we are super excited as it is the first time we are organizing something like that. Um, I want to I want to introduce the whole team of B2B marketers uh, because we are three people. Uh, my colleagues, they are connected. Uh, you, you will see them uh, in the future webinars. Uh, but my colleagues, Ivo Campos and Julian Enico, uh, they are B2B marketing consultants at Ibiqua. Uh, if you don't know Ibiqua, I definitely recommend you to visit their website too. Um, and my name is Gina Gulberti, as I said at the beginning, I'm VP Digital Marketing at Launchmetrics, a software company for fashion, luxury, and beauty brands. So um, what's the main goal that we have at B2B Marketers? Um, obviously, it, it was like, I don't know, more or less a year ago when we were on a bar, like drinking some beers, and suddenly the three of us, we said, hey, guys, why don't we create something that is... Uh, just talking about marketing in the B2B. We have been working in this sector for a really long time. And something that we realize is, is that there are many stuff, many resources, many tools, many uh, information about B2C, but not so much about B2B. Um, so that's why we thought it was a good initiative to uh, start this project. And essentially, uh, B2B marketers is a, it's a global community. It's a community for B2B professionals all around the world. Um, and what we want to do is to share resources and experiences to build innovative ideas that inspire your work, your daily activity in, in your business, in your companies, et cetera. So at the end, uh, that's the main goal that we have. How we pretend to do this? Um, well, as I say, this is the first session, the first webinar we are <laughs> uh, with B2B Marketer. But um, from now on, we want to start like doing different activities like uh, sharing with you guys tips and tools, content resources, or blog will start from tomorrow and we'll start writing some articles um, and also inviting other professionals to write some articles at a, a, a blog. Then online meetups, networking events, uh, we are preparing something uh, really, really soon. Let's see how it goes with the situation, but uh, we would like to start organizing some networking events, physical events, 
then B2B live chats and some training. So at the end, the idea is that we, we can exchange with other professionals uh, that we can, you can also like suggest some ideas on the type of information, resources, activities, or initiatives uh, that could be useful for the B2B industry. And we'll be more than happy to, to kick off them and, and try to, to lead them. So um, as, as starting with the topic of today, uh, as I say, we are going to talk about content marketing in the B2B sector. And if you follow us on Instagram in, and on social uh, media, in the last two months, more or less, we have been asking different professionals from the sector about their main challenges in, in content marketing. Um, so some of them, you can see them on the screen, like Flo from Carto, Conrado from Signature, Eva Kavanagh from uh, Eventbrite, or Clara Avila from GoDaddy. Um, so they share with us some of the main challenges. In some cases, they were talking about measurement, they were talking about um, engaging with the audience, with, they were talking about new uh, formats. So more or less, we are going to talk about all these different challenges in this, uh, in this webinar. And obviously, uh, the best thing is that we have Lee today. There's an expert in B2B, market, in B2B marketing and uh, works really close with many, many companies in the world. Um, so we'll have the opportunity of uh, learning and understanding better like how to solve uh, some of these challenges. And to kick off the, the topic, um, some stats uh, that have been recently published uh, in different publications about B2B uh, marketing and about content marketing specifically. Uh, like for example, 50% of B2B marketers use content marketer, content marketer uh, successfully to achieve top of funnel goals. So um, it seems that uh, the top of the funnel is the, the goal that uh, they are covering better with content marketing. Let's see after uh, what Lee can tell us about that. Then 80% of B2B buyers expect to have a B2C experience. Um, this is something that, for example, uh, Agus Carbajo from uh, Antevenio told us, uh, but also, I guess, Clara Avila, uh, she shares something similar with us. Then 95% of B2B marketers use social media content as the main format to reach out to their audiences. Uh, so yeah, let's talk about the different channels, the different content formats that we can use today. And finally, 43% of B2B marketers measure content marketing return of investment, while 80% measure their daily activity. Let's see afterwards also like um, how it's this S scenario of analyzing everything, of measuring any, everything, and trying to understand the insights that we are getting from that. So, um, say that here we, we have Lee Arden. Um, thank you so much for participating, for, for being part of this first uh, webinar of this uh, first session. So for those of you who uh, don't know uh, who is Lee, uh, so I have been following him for such a long time. Uh, in fact, I, I guess, I mean, we, we met personally, I think like five years ago, more or less, in the PRSA event in Atlanta. And from that moment is when, when we started being in, in contact. So, Lee is the CEO and co-founder of uh, Top Rank Marketing. He will explain a little bit more about uh, the project uh, now. So he's a B2B marketing strategist, world traveler, and CEO of Top Rank in Marketing. His work integrating search, social content, and influencer marketing has been recognized by the Wall Street Journal, The Economist, and Forbes. Uh, over the past 15 years, Lee has uh, evangelized and integrated customer-centric approach to marketing with over 250 presentations in 18 different countries, um, authoring a book on content and SEO called Optimize and Blogging, over uh, 1.4 million words at marketingblog.com. So with this uh, little introduction uh, and summary mm -hmm. of Lee, I will pass uh, to him so he can explain you a little bit more about uh, Top Rank and the project that he is leading. Well, thank you, Gina. That was a very generous uh, introduction, and it's an honor to be here. Uh, congratulations on the launch of B2Bmarketers.com. Uh, it's uh, very uh, ambitious and exciting to see all the things that you have planned, and uh, I think people in the community that you're building are really going to appreciate um, what you're putting together. So thank you, everyone, for joining us today, and um, like I said, I'm very happy to be here. 
Top Rank Marketing, uh, as has been mentioned, is a B2B marketing agency. We like to create experiences that inspire people. So I like to think of my team as experience makers. That's what we're focused on when we create content. And we do that for some of the top B2B brands in the world, uh, SAP, LinkedIn, uh, Adobe, um, Oracle, and, and so forth. So we have quite a bit of experience um, when it comes to solving a variety of different marketing problems um, with content. And our holistic approach to uh, marketing is continuous marketing optimization, where we're working to attract new customers, we're looking to engage them and create a great experience. We want to convert them, but we also want to retain them and inspire advocacy, which in turn creates more attraction. So it's a continuous effort uh, that we take um, in our approach to B2B marketing. Um, we also take uh, what we like to call a best answer content marketing strategy approach, meaning that we are working with companies. Uh, we believe companies, uh, B2B companies that really truly want to stand out in today's environment, they need to provide value to their buyers. They need to provide useful, practical information, inspiring information. They need to create experiences. And ultimately, ultimately, they need to be the best answer for what your customer is trying uh, to find, the questions they're looking to, to answer. So it's an integrated mix of tactics that we recommend. It's not the same all the time. It's really appropriate to the particular customer mix. Um, and on the next slide, you can see that we also take a very methodical approach. Uh, we are very process driven. Uh, it's impossible to scale unless you have process. And so we do integrate search, social content, influencer marketing, um, and uh, in, in a way that is you know, research-based, data-informed, it's personalized. We create strategies, we implement, we promote, and then of course we measure and optimize performance. Um, and on the next slide, um, you'll see that not only are we methodical and process driven, and, and, but we also uh, take a, a very creative approach uh, to B2B marketing. Um, and Gina alluded to the B2C experiences that more and more B2B uh, customers are expecting. And we are very much seeing that in the work that we're doing, including this example, uh, how to break free of boring B2B, complete with a 150 foot tall grizzly bear with lasers coming out of his eyes. Uh, I encourage you to check out the URL uh, to see the promo video for this interactive microsite that we had created for, for an event. Um, it's, it's pretty fun. And as a result, by packaging, uh, a business message in a very friendly and fun, entertaining format. Um, it, the thousands and thousands of views of the microsite and uh, it really resonated and generated a lot of new business. Um, and so I encourage that as a lesson to those tuning in today um, to not only think about how more efficient and effective you can be with your marketing, but also how to be more creative. And I believe with that, I'll turn it back over to Gina, um, who's going to talk a little yeah. more about the industry. I definitely, guys, happening. recommend you to visit uh, this website because it's it's really fun, like, and it's interactive, dynamic, and and it's really cool. Um, well, yeah, let's start then with the with some of the questions that I have prepared for you, Lee, uh, on B two B content marketing. The first one that I have. Yeah, it's related with one of the challenges that some of the professionals have shared with us. Um, so at, at the end, some of them um, mentioned like the way content marketing in B2B is helping like different stages of the marketing funnel. And um, well, I share a stat at the beginning, like talking about the top of the funnel, uh, like how effective content marketing is for the top of the funnel in B2B. But at the end, uh, like in this um, graphic from the Content Marketing Institute that was published at the beginning of this year, like we can see like the different uh, formats that are useful uh, to build brand awareness, uh, to do uh, like secure leads, nurture leads, convert leads. Uh, but my question is for you, like 
we have been talking about um, aligning the content strategy with the whole marketing funnel. Uh, how do you see the B2B companies are doing this today? Like, how, how are they uh, doing this, um, aligning content marketing with the, with the marketing funnel? Sure. So it's very tempting for a lot of marketers to focus on top of funnel and create, you know, pipeline, fill the pipeline, fill the pipeline, fill the pipeline. And that doesn't necessarily equate to sales ready leads, which is what your sales department is looking for and probably why they're ignoring the leads that you are sending them. So in order to help marketing influence uh, and nurture uh, a more qualified prospect, um, it really requires B2B marketers to better understand the customer journey and to realize that in today's environment, buyers are actually pulling themselves through 60 to 90% of the sales process on their own through information that they find. And B2B companies who can document, you know, what is it that the buyer wants to know early or in the middle or late stage and if they can understand what questions buyers have during those different phases as they go through the journey, they can create content that is more uh, specific, relevant, and engaging at each one of those stages. And especially if content is uh, mapped to the entire customer journey, then we can understand or anticipate what the customer experience is going to be when they engage with this top of funnel. But we also always give them something to do next. Like what's the next step they can take? So someone who's wondering about, well, what's, you know, I've got a problem and I need to solve it. What, what's out there to help me solve that problem? Well, that's top of funnel or as we like to say tofu. Um, we love acronyms in B2B. So that's top of funnel or tofu content. And there you have very broad topics that are covered. And we're, under, we're articulating what's the nature of a problem and maybe directionally what sorts of solutions you might want to consider. But then we're going to get a lot more specific with MOFU or middle of funnel content. And so now we've got case studies and examples. Um, and like I said, we're a lot more specific with, okay, here's how this solution might actually work for you. Um, and then we have bottom of funnel content. Now this gets even more specific with things like scoping tools and calculators that really help a prospect understand how a particular solution is literally going to work for them and might even include tools to help them create the cost justifications that they need to bring back to executives at the company who will ultimately, or the buying committee um, at the company that will ultimately have to approve the purchase, right? But it goes beyond that because, as I mentioned in my earlier slide, you know, this continuous effort, this infinity loop of optimization, once you get a customer, it's really important that you keep that customer. So the consideration for B2B marketers isn't just about the funnel, but it's about the entire customer life cycle. And that adds on a couple more steps. Retention, creating content on an ongoing basis. This is marketing, creating content that helps to communicate to customers the continued value of staying with the company and also creating content that helps inspire them to advocate for the company, which brings it back home to uh, helping you attract net new customers, net new business. So um, this is really an important opportunity. It all starts with empathizing with the customer and understanding from their point of view, what kind of information do they need? Not just what do you as a brand want to push out there to them. Hmm. And um, I, I don't know what you think, Lee, but um, in the recent articles that I have read about like B2B and the, and the customer journey, like at the end, it seems that it's not anymore, as you, say, as you said before, it's like a flow. It's not anymore linear. Like it, it doesn't go from point one to point three. It's like you go to point three, then uh, they move uh, to the beginning. So how, how can we like uh, digest uh, this new uh, flow of the customer um, with, with the content? How should we consider that? Sure. So we use a model, very simple model of customer empathy as it relates to the information journey that they are pursuing as they look for solutions. Um, the first step is collecting data on preferences for information discovery. Uh, discovery, consumption, and action are the, is the model, right? So discovery, how are your buyers discovering information? What are they searching on? 
who are they influenced by, what publications do they subscribe to, what social channels are they on, and what do they talk about there, um, what events do they participate in, what special interest groups are they members of, what associations do they, uh, are they a part of, what events do they attend, and that sort of thing. And as we collect, and we can't get all that data, obviously, but we collect as much of that discovery data as possible, and that helps us inform, okay, exactly where to target our information publishing. Uh, from a consumption standpoint, we want to empathize, well, what formats do they want? Do they want video? Do they want live video? Do they want webinars? Do they want text content, white papers, case studies, ebooks, newsletters, print books? We understand what content expectations they have, and that way we can deliver a great experience for them. Um, and then the third step, of course, is um, action. So what are the triggers to take action? And again, this is all data informed. Like we're looking at CRM data, analytics data, we're looking at first party data uh, that we can collect. We literally do customer panels and interviews to collect this kind of information. And when we understand what is it that you need to know to take that next step, we can then, with that insight, optimize, so to speak, our marketing content to help them do what we want them to do, whether that's to download, trial, demo, subscribe, or actually reach out to a sales consultant. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, very interesting. My my next question is um, like around okay, we create this content thinking in this uh, like customer journey. So what happens with the experiences? Because um, we we found a stat uh, that is coming from eMarketer uh, last year that says that eighty percent of B two B buyers expect a B two C experience when interacting with brands. Uh, I don't know what what do you think, Lee, um, about this concept of trying to create B two C experiences that are adapted to the B two B consumer. Yeah, this this is definitely a trend. That you know, there's an expression: the B's in B two B are people too, <laughs> and that means empathizing with buyers as people, not just as corporations. And a lot of times, you see in B two B marketing, we're just identifying someone by role by the company they work for, by the decision we want them to make, and not taking into account their personal interests as a human being. And, you know, especially in technology and software and B2B, we're seeing a lot more consumerization of B2B software, where business users of software expect consumer-like software experiences. Well, that same type of expectation is coming to B2B marketing, meaning that as a marketer stat, as you shared, uh, shows that B2B uh, buyers are expecting consumer-like experiences. So instead of just the white paper uh, type of experience, the, the newsletter, the webinar, uh, the trade show booth, that type of experience, they're actually looking for something that can connect with them um, and not just inform them, but help them actually feel something. So we're seeing a lot more purpose-driven marketing uh, happen in B2B. When you look at um, you know, what the millennial, and I know this is a generalization, but when you look at people that are in a millennial age, um, one of the first, there's some study by HubSpot that says that the first thing they look for on a B2B website is the social causes that that business brand is actually uh, engaged in. Well, what do you find when you go to most B2B websites? Products, services, products, services, buy now. And you have to dig to find what social uh, causes uh, that they might be, or community-oriented causes that they might be a part of. So it's about understanding the customer and giving them content in the format they want. So here's an example. You know how unboxing videos are really popular in B2C? Like, hey, here's a new iPhone, here's a new iPad. Uh, I was just watching unboxing videos of the new iPad Pro. Um, you know, it was interesting. What about unboxing a server? <laughs> Uh, I've talked to some um, B2B influence, technology influencers who actually publish these server unboxing videos where they'll take this big server and set it up and it'll take there were three or four people configuring it, setting it up. It'll take them four hours, but people are watching it, right? And, it, and they're answering questions that they as buyers really want to know. And at the end, they're like, wow, now I know what I need to know. And it, it was in a format that is very... B2C sort of friendly. So the other thing is LinkedIn and LinkedIn Live um, shows by B2B people, people who work in a B2B environment, technology, uh, uh, not just technology, but manufacturing, any other industry that are publishing via video and live streaming video, either from events or these days they're publishing from home, um, 
uh, and just talking about issues that are of concern to that audience. And so this is a very consumer-like experience that, or an experience that you often find in consumer or B2C environments, but now you see people talking about business issues um, in a more personal way using platforms like LinkedIn Live, if you're lucky enough to have access to it, or even through something like Periscope on Twitter or Facebook Live. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah, got it. We need to create like experiences for, yeah, at the end we are talking to people in both cases, even if it's a B2B, B2C, we are talking to human uh, that is working or a human that is consuming for a personal, um, I don't know, personal thing, but at the end, yeah, you, you need to, to create this, this experiences for, for them. Um, my next question, we received one of the challenges from um, Flo Reddick from uh, Carto that was talking about SEO in B2B, like the challenge of creating SEO strategies. And uh, we found this stat, this, uh, this is coming from, um, from a report that was also published at the end of 2019, uh, that was telling that only 7% uh, of the B2B organizations say that their goal when producing content is uh, adding SEO value. And I would like to agree, <laughs> like SEO is sometimes challenging depending on the sector you are trying to, to, to work on. And with Google making so much change in their algorithm, but at the end, what do you think we should consider when kicking off an SEO strategy on content? Because at the, at the end, I don't know what you are going to tell me, but I think it's pretty important. This 7% is... I was surprised, in fact, when I saw it. Yeah. So I agree. That is very surprising. So here's the thing. Um, what better time to be in front of your customer than at the very moment they're looking for a solution? Right? I mean, people are spending, B2B companies are spending millions of dollars to get in that moment. And the beautiful thing about organic search optimization and even paid search is that you can you can optimize your way into that moment uh you've got to work of course but you you can bring yourself into that moment and you don't necessarily have to spend millions of dollars or even hundreds of thousands of dollars necessarily to, to achieve it and here's the thing um you know, i can talk a little bit about some broad-based seo tactics uh, you know obviously you have technical seo you've got to make sure that your pages load fast and this is a content marketer doesn't have to be concerned with this but they do need to partner with IT to make sure that the site is mobile friendly, pages load fast, and there are certain types of markup to help uh, Google understand and classify the kind of content uh, that you're publishing. Make it easy for Google to do what it is that you want Google to do, right? Um, but right now, um, you know, a lot of a lot of people aren't real responsive to explicit marketing messages. That's not what they're worried about right now. I mean, I mean right now. Okay. So, but the work doesn't stop. The the need, their need to find solutions hasn't gone away. They're just not responsive to explicit marketing messages at the moment. So I can't stress how important SEO is right now, because if you're able to optimize your content and make sure that it's relevant and useful and engaging and that it is very friendly to search engines. Um, that way you're connecting your brand's content with customers on their terms. So you're allowing your customers to pull themselves to you. And again, what better time to be in front of your customer than in the very moment that they're looking for a solution. So, that doesn't mean you create content solely for the purpose of SEO. That Those days are gone. Uh, but you do want to follow some SEO best practices to make it easy for Google to crawl and index and rank your content in the way that is truly useful to your customers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, yeah, I say that when I saw this 7%, I was, like, terrified. In fact, because even for us at Launch Metrics, like, Today, almost 80% of the traffic that we are getting to the website is coming from organic search. So thanks to the SEO efforts that we are doing in every content piece that we are producing and, and so on. So yeah, yep. I think there are like many good opportunities in, in, in SEO and optimizing uh, for getting a qualified uh, audience. You know, I, I should say that um, I just published an article about this very topic uh, two days ago on marketingblog.com. 
And I actually got advice from a group of uh, nine SEO experts from all over the world. And so, you know, feel free to check that out. Yeah, sure. Maybe it's something that we could, yeah, share with the audience uh, in that summary of, the, of this webinar because about the different content formats. All right, super. Um, that we can produce for the for the marketing funnel and so on. Um, so my next topic and question challenge from the professionals uh, is about content formats, like how to maximize the opportunity uh, with the different uh, formats we produce. In this HubSpot report uh, published at the end of last year, um, we can see like the content types B2B marketers used in the last 12 months, and we can see that social media content was 95%, blog posts, short articles, 89%, email newsletters, in-person events. Um, I want to specifically ask you, Lee, uh, because I know you are kind of a lover of this format about podcasting. Like I know you guys in the U.S. Uh, are much more evolved in this in this uh, content format, but not so much here in Europe. I have to say. So, what do you think podcasts uh, can achieve as part of the content marketing strategy in B two B? Sure. Well, you're right. Podcasts are quite hot in the U.S. right now, and the reason is is that they're a format that's easy for customers to to, uh, to subscribe to and consume during latent uh, moments of time, like their commute to work or even when they're at work, because a lot of people are wearing these things as they're working and they can listen uh, a lunch break or whatever. So it's a way for people to be productive and continually educate themselves and stay on top of what's happening in an industry. Um, podcasts on the receiving end feel like a one-to-one -one engagement, and they're really effective at building a connection um, with the audience in a way that other formats like text just don't. And these days, without real-world conferences, um, you know, people are looking for alternative events or alternative formats like virtual events, um, like video, like webinars, like this, and and podcasts. Um, and they're pretty effective format for delivering really effective um, content in a way that feels personal. So when we talk about creating experiences for your customer, uh, you've got to consider what their preferences are for information consumption. As I mentioned, you know, our customer empathy model as it relates to information takes into account how do they like to discover content? How, what are their preferences for consumption of that content? What are the triggers for action? And on the consumption side of things, I can't stress enough how um, effective podcasts can be. And we, in our case, we helped uh, 3M and you may know them as the company who makes post-it notes and hundreds or thousands of other types of products. We helped let them launch their very first podcast uh, where we're ad advocating of the role of science in business and, the, and, and in consumers' everyday lives. And uh, have hit record numbers of downloads and reached people in a format that they were not previously engaging on. Um, another example I'm thinking of is SAP. Uh, we worked with SAP to help them launch the Tech Unknown podcast, where um, they are literally creating shows like you would hear on the radio. Like we're creating, we're producing these amazing auditory experiences, um, taking users or listeners from you know a coffee shop in Seattle, not really, but we're creating that illusion, to uh, a farm in Thailand, to uh, a business office in Germany and having conversations between experts at SAP and industry experts and publishing these on a regular cadence actually as a season using TV shows as a metaphor and uh, sorry about that. <laughs> um, <laughs> is, yeah, this is the new reality, right? Yeah. This is the new reality. And, you know, I, I could show you my dog too, but he's, she's hiding yeah, somewhere. I, anything <laughs> 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 but the point is, um, it's it's something that um, is is really relevant in terms of connection. Um, and uh, like I said, you know, podcasts it, it it can seem daunting doing a new thing, but I can assure you, and I'm lucky enough to have some podcasting experts on our team um, that have brilliant editing uh, skills, and of course, clients who have the vision um, of wanting to do something in a way that will truly creating experience for their customers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. 
Um, let's talk now about the, I mean, the biggest challenge of everyone that is like measurement. Um, like I found this, um, this is that from the Content Marketing Institute again, uh, they published a B2B report this year in January, I guess. Uh, there's pretty interesting for everyone who wants to check. Um, and it says that 44% of B2B marketers say their organization doesn't measure a uh, return of investment on content marketing efforts and 12% are unsure. I, I don't know what do you think about um, this so important part of uh, content marketing? Like, like at the end, do you think we are measuring too much today? Like there is a ton of tools, metrics, indicators we are using, but are we really getting the good insights in content for, for taking decisions? Yeah, so it is interesting, especially with the uh, proliferation of MarTech software, there are more ways to measure than we would ever be able to consume. I call it MarTech shock, to borrow from Mark Schaefer's expression, content shock, um, where there's more content being produced than we will ever consume in our lifetime. So there's the, the technology of MarTech uh, software uh, does reveal metrics and new data points that we can take into account. And so at some level, I suppose we are we have the opportunity to measure too much, but what's important is to measure what matters. And that aligns with your strategy and your goals, being very clear about what is it that you're trying to achieve with what audience, what kind of value are you creating for your audience and how will that translate into new business for your company? What are the key performance indicators that show that you're on the right track? And ultimately, what are the measurable business outcomes that you're after? And when you have clarity on those KPIs and business goals, you work backwards to map them to your content plan or your content marketing program. And a lot of times companies aren't as sophisticated as they want to be. They're understaffed and under-resourced and they start skipping steps. They start just not doing some things in order to get things published with no trackable or encoded URLs, for example, and no dashboard set up. Who knows why? Um, to simplify things, we like to use, I love trilogies, right? I like things in threes. So uh, we use uh, attract, engage, convert metrics. Um, so any piece of content has to be accountable uh, in its ability to attract the right audience, right? And so we, are, we, we map metrics to the uh, attract dimension of a particular piece of content or a campaign. Uh, from an engagement standpoint, standpoint um, obviously, we want to measure to what degree is this content creating experience uh, for, for the audience that does find it and consumes it. And then from a conversion standpoint, of course, that's anything related to a form. Uh, the downloads, the trials, the demos, uh, the inquiries, the sales transactions, and the, even the referrals. Um, and there are more metrics than that, obviously, especially as you get into retention and advocacy. But um, I think you have to focus on measuring what matters and creating a system and a process that your people will follow to make sure that they are uh, architecting content that is measurable, that there's a goal that it maps to, and that there's some level of accountability and oversight via a dashboard um, so that you can review progress you can make adjustments, and ultimately you can answer to the performance uh, that you're delivering. And what department is better to answer to than sales? <laughs> um, and that you're delivering leads that they can actually do something with. Yeah, okay, yeah, got it. Um, okay, we are almost finishing uh, with the questions, I mean, with, the, um, with some of the challenges. Um, so guys, if you have any questions for Lee, um, start using the question box here below um so to finalize um i i was looking for more or less you know the typical articles that everyone is writing like at the beginning of the year with the trends for this uh, new year in marketing and the trends uh, what is going to happen and um i found like a couple of uh, articles talking about the main uh like trend this year was going to be for b2b marketers account-based marketing abm and then uh, like 44% in, uh, in this study say that account-based marketing is, there, uh, is going to be the main thing. But then also we found some other stats like uh, interactive content, 42%, uh, 
uh, like personalization, uh, 41%, influencer marketing, 37%. Uh, so I was going to ask you, Lee, like, uh, what do you think about this new trend of ABM, using ABM in B2B marketing, and, and even some of, of uh, these other trends that, that we can see here from, from this report? Sure. So first, let's talk about what, what is ABM. Uh, account-based marketing is about being extremely focused and specific about who you're trying to sell to. It's not about, oh, we sell to, you know, manufacturers of widgets. No, we're selling to Acme widget company. It's Acme. And who? Who at Acme? Well, it's the director of procurement. It is the uh, vice president of operations. It is the CXO of whatever, right? These are the very specific people on the buying committee at that specific company. And so ABM is about being a lot more specific and also uh, uh, more, more specific about who you're trying to sell to and not just throwing digital spaghetti against the wall in an industry segment and hoping that some of it sticks and these leads come in and maybe some of them will be qualified, some of them won't. No, it's literally about marketing to individuals at companies, but it's also about a collaboration with sales. So marketing doesn't just get to decide who's a great customer. Um, we go and we coordinate with sales to understand, okay, who is our buyer? What are literally the things that they care about? What are the questions they ask during the sales process? What are the objections that they have? How are you countering them? And really collecting valuable data so that marketing can then take those insights and then provide these very hyper-focused content experiences for that audience. Um, we may target them with um, advertising that is, again, with you know, digital advertising these days can be so super-focused, um, and, and we can get on their radar, and then we can create opportunities for them to engage. Uh, we can have conversations. We can have them attend a webinar. We can send them dimensional mailers. Uh, direct mail is making a comeback in ABM actually, because it is a tactile experience. And then that can lead to a, a sales conversation. So there's different plays as they call them, sequences of uh, marketing activities uh, that occur within ABM. And really a lot of people that have been involved in ABM just think of it as ABM is just good marketing. You know, ABM is, ABM is B2B really, if you think about it, it's what B2B should be. Instead of broad based, sweeping generalizations um, of content. I mean, you have to have some brand building, yes, but being super focused and super targeted is the promise that ABM brings. And that's why it's so popular. Um, it's difficult to implement. You do need technology. It, I should say it's difficult to implement at scale. That's what I mean. And so it does require technology, uh, platforms like Engageo or Demandbase or, or a Terminus or something like that. But especially if you're a large enterprise. Um, but it is something that is delivering some pretty incredible results for those companies who have figured it out. Okay, got it. Yeah, super interesting. Yeah, in fact, we had we are going to start with some of the questions from the that we are receiving from the audience and then some others that we receive in social media. Um, yeah, one of the questions was exactly like, what do you mean by account-based marketing? So you already explained that. Um, we have another question from Roman uh, that says, hi, my name is Roman Curry, and my question is related to this new era that we are confronting that nobody expected. Uh, my question is, do B2B and B2C companies need to rethink and adapt to people's uh, product actual situation, changing strategies during the sales process? I mean, it was a question that we expected for today, obviously. Like, what is going yeah. to happen? How do you see the, yeah. the future, Lee? Yep. And, and actually, this is another topic I just wrote about on uh, marketingblog.com. So um, how to market in an age of uh, COVID-19. Um, you know, we have as businesses, we have an obligation to do what we can do. Um, we have a role. We all as individuals have a role to play. Um, and at the same time, as I mentioned before and, and, and in the article, the work doesn't stop. Um, but we do absolutely have to be empathetic uh, to what's on the mind of our buyer. And right now, that might mean that we're not going to rely so heavy on demand gen and lead gen activities, and that we might emphasize more brand-focused activities, um, articulate, you know, I mean, 
obviously different organizations have different resources available to them and what they can do to help their community, to help their employees in this very challenging time. And I think communicating those things is part of that brand uh, um, marketing message uh, opportunity. Uh, at the same time, it's really about talking to your customers, get close to your customers if you're not already and ask them, you know, what can we do to help you or be proactive. I mean, I know we're looking at data that is helping us proactively approach our customers and letting them know, hey, um, for example, uh, Dell Outlet, you know, Dell Outlet sells uh, uh, computers to small businesses. And we're seeing that, you know, how many small businesses are now required to work from home? This is an opportunity for you to offer, you know, computers to those folks. Or we have another client, uh, Monday.com, which is project management software, and they're offering work from home, pro you know, project virtual project management software. And, and this is a huge opportunity for them uh, to get their message out, but in a relevant way, right? It, so it's very important not to be opportunistic. Uh, it can come across, it can go wrong. It just, it can just go wrong. Um, and also not to be doing things uh, from a status quo if things are not uh, normal um, so stay close to your customers understand what is it that they need and give them what they need to the extent that it's relevant for your business and understand that you can create stronger relationships in a challenging time like this and really show who you are as a company and why that matters because as things start to become back to normal who's going to be top of mind with your customers that person who kept hitting them with those drip emails <laughs> And that salesperson who kept on bothering them with phone calls or the company who reached out and said, what can we do to help you? And then actually does something to help them. Yeah, totally true. Yeah, I don't know how many emails I received from, from companies this day, uh, like with discounts, offers, and I don't know what else. So, yeah, I, I think we, we need to, yeah, to, to think, take our time and be with our customers, definitely. Um, we have another question from Valentina. Uh, she says, I work in an innovation consulting. Um, what's the best strategy in social media in this competitive market? Uh, Value-based marketing? I guess the, the, what's the best strategy in social media in this competitive market? In a competitive market, um, be more useful, be more entertaining. It's not enough to inform people. You've got to entertain them, or as I like to say, infotain them. And so you may want to think about content formats and messages that can be, um, again, in this today's environment, empathetic to your buyer, but at the same time, you know, you've got to have a deep connection with your customer, what they really, really care about. One of the, you know, the expression low hanging fruit, the easy things to do is an act of empathy, meaning not focusing so much on how you want to be known, and what you want to sell, but actually interviewing some customers or prospective customers and asking them what's top of mind for you today. What are the challenges that you're facing today? What are the things that are really compelling to you in the market today? What are some really great examples of how you've been communicated with? Collect all that information and react to it and go ahead and give those customers what they want. That's the easiest thing you could possibly do. Uh, through social media or any other channel. Um, but like I said, when I started, you know, it's not enough just to inform them. It's, it, it's about entertainment too. So you're going to have to break out the personality B2B. And I know B2B is not known for having charisma or personality necessarily. Um, but there are plenty of people that do have that. And, um, uh, and, and there's, you don't have to go all out. You don't have to put on a, a TV show. Uh, you know, as some people are doing um, on LinkedIn Live or YouTube, um, but you can talk about things that customers care about in an interesting way, a more interesting way than you are right now. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, you got it. You know, one one other thing I would I would uh, suggest to people is, and I can't stress how valuable this has been for us, and that is, if you really want to connect with your customers, invite them to collaborate in the very marketing that you're going to then use. So uh, think of it as crowdsourcing with your customers uh, and literally inviting, you know, identifying customers who um, are active publishing and articulating points of view and invite them uh, to collaborate with you on content that will be useful to your industry. 
This is a great way to create an experience for them where they are investing some of their time in something and that investment will inspire mm -hmm. them to help want to make it be successful to everyone. And this can be a very, uh, very useful show of good faith, if you will, uh, right now. But I can tell you, even before our current environment, we've been doing this for the last seven or eight okay. years and it's been incredibly um, effective let's for B2B answer one of to the literally invite prospective uh, customers social media to join us in co-creating content together. Um, she said, I would like to see some best practices on how to measure and attribute social and content to revenue, as well as how to combine thought leadership and SEO for your brand. Yeah, sure. <laughs> that is that is that is a book. That is that is, the answer to that. That's two questions, and each one of them is its own book. Um, so obviously, you know, uh, measurement in social requires you to encode your URLs with the attributes that you're tracking. Um, when you publish something, um, and it has a URL, you put in attributes. Uh, that, that will help you then track it through Google Analytics or whatever your analytics platform is. And so uh, whether you, through sessions or setting cookies, uh, which you have to get permission for, uh, obviously with GDPR and all that, um, you know, you're, you're, that, that's how you're going to be able to track whether that social content ultimately resulted in some sort of ROI. And, and just understand that it, a lot of times that stuff's going to get lost. You know, people strip out that code. Uh, they, they share between platforms and then therefore your encoding gets lost and that's what's going to happen. So you're going to have to think about correlation uh, data, meaning that, okay, here's a time frame and here's a graph uh, and we published our social content here and here we see a corresponding increase in the number of inquiries around that very specific topic, even though in our analytics it doesn't show that this social share on Facebook resulted on a, a, a transaction over here. If you if if you that's another level of again correlation is not causation and yet it may inform you that oh we are moving the needle with some of our activities. Okay. Uh, again, um, I think there's we are a lot more to say about this, uh, that when it comes yeah, to um, analytics. I mean, in um, any case, uh, for you guys who are still point. connected, as I um, said at the beginning, we are going to write a summary of, of this session. So uh, feel free to send us your if you have any other questions oh, okay. and we'll be happy to to answer and to share them with uh, Lee um, so before I, I think you wanted to share something with the audience right Lee yes I didn't yeah, so so our agency is uh, is is the is as a B two we do a lot of B two B influencer marketing, uh, content marketing, and we are conducting the very first B two B influencer marketing study. Um, most other studies are all focused on broad based influencer marketing or B two C specifically. This is only about B two B. So if you've considered, tested, or are already implementing, doesn't matter. Uh, we have questions for you. Uh, and so I would invite you to take the survey, to share it with your B2B peers. Uh, the URL is below, tprk.us slash B2Bim2020. I uh, encourage you to take the survey again, whether you've just considered it, whether you've piloted it and experimented, or whether you're um, uh, involved in ongoing influencer marketing right now, there are, are uh, there's things you know that we would like to understand. And this is uh, going to be turned into a report uh, that we will publish uh, to benefit the industry at large because there's a lot of misinformation. There's a lot of things that are just significantly different about B2B than B2C. And if you're tired of hearing references to, um, oh, that dumb festival, <laughs> the fire festival and Kardashians as it relates to influencer marketing and B2B, then please take this study because we're going to fix all that. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, we'll, we'll fill in also. Uh, so yeah, guys, um, please participate at this survey because it's super interesting. Well, say that. Um, thank you so much, Lee. It was a pleasure. It was really interesting, all the insights and all the learnings that we got from you today. Um, thanks for being part of this first B2B Marketer session. 
Well, thank you, Gina. And thank you, everyone. Uh, really appreciate the questions. I hope it was valuable to you. And feel free to, to reach out and ask any other questions. I'm looking forward to seeing the wrap up and to seeing all the great things that B2Bmarketers.com is going to accomplish for your community. Thank you so much, Lee. Um, for the audience, uh, thank you so much. As I said, we'll be sharing really soon like a summary of the session, the recording, the presentation, and then stay tuned at B2Bmarketers.com because we'll be organizing new webinar sessions in the future in English, in Spanish, and uh, we'll start sharing some tips, resources, and we'll be really happy to hear also from you like um, questions, suggestions, uh, initiatives. So that's the main goal of uh, B2E marketers. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Lee. Have a great day. Stay safe. And uh, you see you soon, guys. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.